North Korea, Russia, and China together in Pyongyang, delegations of the highest level, including General Sergei Shoigu, Russia's defense minister, arriving in North Korea, where Kim Jong-un is about to put on a massive military parade to broadcast his nuclear prowess. All of this coming as tensions are rising between North Korea and the United States, and the fate of that U.S. soldier who crossed into North Korea is unclear. Will Ripley is out front. A massive show of force in the North Korean capital, Pyongyang marking 70 years since the end of the Korean War. A time for North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to project nuclear power with a powerful patron signaling support. China sending its highest level delegation to North Korea since 2019, the first since COVID restrictions plunged the secretive state into near total isolation led by a senior Communist Party official with close ties to President Xi Jinping. Russian President Vladimir Putin sending his defense minister to North Korea, a visit to strengthen Russian-North Korean military ties, the ministry says. Two high-level visits by Russia and China coming at a crucial time for Kim's regime. Rapidly rising tensions with the U.S., North Korea's longest ever ICBM test, a barrage of ballistic and cruise missile launches, a rare stopover in South Korea by a nuclear-capable U.S. submarine. And one week ago, an American soldier's surprise sprint into North Korea. U.S. Army Private Travis King, the first active-duty U.S. service member to cross the heavily armed border in more than 40 years. The Korean DMZ, the demilitarized zone, is one of the most heavily fortified border areas in the world. That's the reason why you have barricades and spike strips and all of these military checkpoints to try to prevent people from being able to go in or come out. I've made several trips to the North Korean side of the DMZ, including this visit in 2015. Is there a real danger here of something breaking out? Yes. That ominous exchange with a North Korean soldier came true last week. A U.S. soldier sprinting across the military demarcation line during a tour of the heavily armed Joint Security Area. Clearly, we're in a very difficult and complex situation. A situation some say should never have happened. Private King was being sent home to be booted from the army. He spent almost 50 days in a South Korean jail for assault, but somehow managed to join a tour group visiting the DMZ. King's name on a passenger manifest approved by the United Nations Command. How could that person's name in any situation be, be allowed to actually get so close where they can run across, uh, you know, into North Korea? That ongoing inquiry seeks to establish details such as those. The State Department says North Korea acknowledged receiving a message from the UN command last week. Radio silence ever since. King's condition, his location, his future in North Korean captivity, unknown. What we do know, Aaron, is that that soldier is likely very low on Kim Jong-un's priority list right now. He just met with Russia's defense minister. He got a letter hand-delivered from Vladimir Putin. We know that North Korea has a stockpile of artillery, maybe for sale. Maybe they're talking to the Russians about that. Of course, they have this huge Chinese delegation in town as well. There are banquets. There's going to be this big military spectacle in the streets of Pyongyang, likely in the overnight hours here. And North Korea is sitting pretty. The elite sitting pretty in Pyongyang, getting things that they need, borders reopening. No need to talk to the United States about this soldier. All right. Thank you very much, Will Ripley. And I want to go now to Samantha Power, the administrator for the U.S. Agency for International Development, also the former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and she just returned from Ukraine. And Administrator Power, I, I want to talk to you about uh, Ukraine and your uh, most recent visit in just a moment. But first, uh, on the back of Will's reporting, these high-level leaders from China and Russia all together with Kim Jong-un in North Korea coming as, uh, you know, Putin hand, that letter from Putin is hand-delivered by General Shoigu to Kim Jong-un and announcing an official trip from Putin to China later this year. When you put all this together, do you think China is backing Putin more than ever? Well, I think just panning out from one moment in time in a very isolated country where uh, Russia is establishing uh, its popularity. Um, Russia is also convening an Africa Leaders Summit uh, in not too long, in the next week, um, where 
attendance at that summit has plummeted from the last time that it tried to convene African leaders. I think 16 or 17 leaders will attend, last time 43. When President Biden extended invitations to African leaders, all who were invited attended 49 leaders. So Russia's isolation actually is, I think, not um, getting addressed by mass disinformation in the global south, by visits like this that try to play up uh, the allies he has left. Um, with regard to the PRC, obviously we engage the PRC and would fi find it deeply problematic, as would so many countries in the global south, uh, if military assistance were provided. Uh, but right now, again, our focus is to solidify and maintain this, the uh, solid uh, allied coalition that has existed since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. And you see in the wake of Russia's really horrific and devastating decision to pull out of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, uh, real revulsion uh, in a lot of developing countries. And the PRC is very mindful of what public opinion in developing countries indicates. Indeed, the PRC is one of the major recipients of wheat that had been coming from Ukraine from mm. the Black Sea. So we're hopeful that in the dialogue that exists in North Korea and every place else, uh, that Beijing is raising its voice and its concern over what Putin is doing. I would note also yes. that when Putin struck uh, Odessa, in the wake of, of my visit there, it was actually the Chinese consulate uh, that shook and, and right. itself was, was damaged in those strikes. So there's a lot to talk about. Right, and certainly that was very notable. Actually, that was something that uh, Michael Bacherku, a resident of the port city of Odessa, frequent guest on the show, wrote about when he was writing about the strikes that he is living through uh, day after day in Odessa right now. Um, you know, you point out that regarding this grain deal, Ukraine is crucial, and it is, right? I mean, it's one of the world's largest suppliers of grain, corn, wheat, everything, right? It was known as the breadbasket of the former USSR for a reason. The World Food Program gets 80% of its grain from Ukraine. And Michael Bacherku, who I just mentioned, also wrote, uh, Administrator, quote, as much as words of condemnation from austere bodies such as UNESCO have become a customary response to Russian aggression, Words don't repel missiles the way the patriots do. Do you support more patriot missiles now as a way to provide security to Odessa, to provide security for this food that the world so desperately needs? Well, I met with President Zelensky um, the day after, actually, <clears throat> the most severe strikes on Odessa, and again, just the day after I had been in Odessa myself, and we discussed a variety of ways of defending a city that had actually been, relative to other Ukrainian cities, relatively immune to the kind of bombardment and missile strikes, in part because of this UN broker deal. It offered a kind of collateral protection, it seems. Um, and you saw the, earlier this week the United States announce a new drawdown, a new security assistance package. I've just been up on Capitol Hill all day today engaging senators about our next uh, uh, request for, you know, additional uh, resources on the civilian side, which of course will be coupled with security assistance. So the last thing I'm going to do on behalf of President Biden is preview where that assistance will go, but it's very mm. clear that now that Odessa is a target, that thinking collectively uh, among allies and partners to Ukraine about what the next step is is very important. And I would say that out of the Vilnius summit, the uh, Ukraine-NATO Council was created and actually had an emergency meeting this week in light of Russia's decision to pull out of the, the Black Sea Grain Initiative to discuss what additional defenses are needed. And, Minister, because of your specific view on this right now and your role, how worried you are you about a full-scale global food crisis if Russia continues these attacks, enforces the blockade, and stops that grain? I'm really worried. Um, you know, wheat prices are up as of midday today. They were up by 10% since Russia pulled out. But I'm not only worried. We're working with the Ukrainians to look to diversify their export routes. And indeed, you've probably heard about, you know, working by rail, river, road, that Danube River ports uh, have increased from 3 million metric tons a year to just shy of 3 million metric tons a month actually leaving Ukraine. So we're not going to sit idle and wait for Putin to change his mind. I do think this Africa Leaders Summit that he's convening, I'm hopeful, will be an occasion where African leaders will try to press him uh, to go back to the deal, given the stakes uh, among the poorest of the poor communities in the world. But we are going to have to compensate in some fashion as more hungry people 
are created by Putin's decision to weaponize food and to try to destroy the Ukrainian economy. Administrator Power, thank you very much. I appreciate your time tonight.